I haven't given you a chance to participate in the sermon recently, so in There's a particular unique kind of cheese that's unique to the country. It's called katupiri. You don't need to remember that. It's kind of like a cross between brie and cream cheese. It's very popular. It finds its way into all different kinds of foods from pizza to pastries to desserts and to snacks. But due to its popularity, it gave rise to many imitations. So fakes that try to pass themselves off as the original. So the true brand of this cheese began to mark their packaging with the term legitimate, the legitimate katupiri. There were more and more imitations, but only one truly authentic katupiri cheese. This morning, I, I just thought I would start with a, uh, you know, a cheesy introduction. Uh groans, please, yes. This morning, we're beginning a six-part series called At the Core, Values That Guide First Friends Church. And over these weeks, we'll be examining our six core values, worship, word, mission, family, authenticity, and generosity. And my goal is that we would come to understand how each of these values is rooted in the gospel and how we want them to shape our pursuit of the vision that God's given us. And I know you all know our vision statement by heart, but if you're new this morning, I want to put it up on the screen so you can see it. As First Friends Church, we live to glorify God together by loving Him, making disciples, and proclaiming the gospel. Today, we start with the value authenticity. There are probably a lot of different ways to understand or define that word, But here's the phrase that we have adopted. Authenticity is the willingness to be truly known. Because the temptation to which we are all prone is like the fake cheese, to masquerade as something that we are not. Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's overt. I remember one time I was preaching in Brazil and I wanted to use an example of something that had come up in our family devotions. But here's the issue. I caught this in myself just before I was about to share it. Being consistent with family devotions was a challenge for us from the time we were married until now. So we would go through seasons where we were consistent for several weeks or for months, but then we would slide back into inconsistency. And I realized that I was about to share this story that I I was going to say, so in our family devotions the other night, Ethan said such and such, but I caught, it was the Holy Spirit caught something in my heart. He said, you're saying it and phrasing it that way because you want to give the impression that this is something that always happens in your house. And it was subtle, but it was something that, a, a way that I wanted to project myself as being better or more spiritual or more disciplined than I actually am. And the fact, the reality of becoming more authentic is to allow ourselves to be known as we are. 1 Corinthians 13 is generally known as the love chapter. It is incredibly powerful for many reasons, but in the next to last verse, Paul writes this phrase, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, now here's the phrase, even as I am fully known. In this single verse, the Apostle Paul reminds us that each one, no matter who we are, is already fully known by God. And while this divine knowledge could be terrifying, right? Because that means every flaw, every lie, every bad thought, every shaded motive, God knows and sees. But for those who have come to Jesus and believe in Him, we are no less fully known, but we are entirely loved. And there's no greater freedom than that. 
In fact, that, maybe we can even say that's the definition of freedom, to be fully known and at the same time entirely loved. So this morning, we're going to look at the enemy of authenticity, the doorway to authenticity, and then living in authenticity. So we start with the enemy of authenticity. I, I can't recall if I shared in this context or if it was in the pastor's class about something I did when I was in eighth grade. On a dare from a friend, I hung out of the 11th story uh, window of an, of an apartment building. I hung out. In the minutes following what I did, as the, as the gravity of that sank in, I was overwhelmed by a lot of different emotions, but the primary one was shame. I felt so dumb. I felt stupid. I felt so exposed. I also got in major trouble. So I had done something foolish in front of not only five of my friends, but also a bunch of strangers. People that were down on the ground saw this. It caused a panic. And I treated the value of my life like it was a, a piece of chewed gum, you know, that lost its flavor. So it was just, you know, toss it out the window. And this shame actually followed me into adulthood. It was hard for me to even think about that and remember it. It was even harder for me to talk about it. And any time it came up either in my mind or in conversation, it would make me cringe inwardly with shame. And friends, the greatest enemy of authenticity is shame. It's illustrated for us so clearly in the third chapter of Genesis. You know the story. The context is that Adam and Eve are created, the first human beings, and they're placed in the Garden of Eden by God to care for it, to tend it, and primarily to be in relationship with God. Total and utter authenticity, fully known, um, specifically in Genesis 2.25, the author writes that Adam and Eve were naked and without shame. So in other words, they were fully exposed, but there was no accompanying shame. You know, there's a reason that so many of our nightmares have to do with us appearing in public naked, because it's so shameful, and we become, we're so exposed and at the mercy of others. But listen to the account of what happens when Adam and Eve, who are in this perfect context, full authenticity, fully authentic with the Lord, and then they choose sin. Okay, you know the story, but listen nonetheless, Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Sisters and brothers, when God asks a question of a person, it's never because God needs information. It's always because He's trying to get us to reflect on our condition. The Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. The immediate effect of sin was a sense of being utterly exposed and vulnerable in that sin, right? Because they're exposed before God, and their first reaction was to cover, to self-protect, and to hide. Because God's next question is, who told you you were naked? You know, up until this point, that's never been an issue. So who like, who like burst the bubble? Who told you that? And obviously, the answer is no one. It was the sin that revealed that. Where before sin, there was total authenticity, a freedom of knowing and being known. With sin came deep shame and accompanying terror of exposure. So the natural response is to, to cover, right? They, first, they sew fig leaves together, cover that exposure. And then in, in this incredibly ironic and foolish attempt, they, they, they get in the tree line because they think they can hide their shame from God. Because 
Shame tells us this lie. And many of you are very familiar with this lie. Many of you have lived with it for your whole life. Some of you are aware of it and you know it's a lie and yet it is still so difficult to combat it. But here's the lie that shame tells us. If others, and by others that includes God, if others and God knew who I really am in all my brokenness, they could not love me and would reject me. And because of that, shame drives us to self-protect, to erect barriers, to fashion masks so that we appear to be something that we're not, all with the intent of hiding our true selves. And that drive is one of the most pervasive and powerful forces in the world. And since Adam and Eve, every member of the human race has been born into that shame and into the terror of being exposed in our brokenness. I'm sure most of you know how a pearl is formed when a tiny grain of sand or some kind of other irritant gets into an oyster. Rather than ejecting that, the oyster starts forming these layers of lacquer over that particular irritant so that it doesn't irritate anymore. But over time, they put more and more and more and more layers. Ultimately, that creates a beautiful pearl. But like the oyster, in our shame and fear, we create layer after layer of protective barriers and masks, desperate to never be exposed, to never be truly known. And it's like a wound or a cut that's really dirty, and it's bandaged, but it's never purified or cleansed. So even though it's covered under that bandage, it's just festering and putrefying. Hiding doesn't deal with the shame. Hiding just isolates us more, and in that isolation, the decay of our souls accelerates. But there's hope. We are not doomed to live lives of quiet desperation, growing further and further into isolation, because there's a doorway to authenticity. In college, I went to a particular gathering. It's far too detailed for me to go into all the background of it, but I'll just say this. During that gathering, I was really fighting. Actually, I wasn't really fighting. I was just reveling in my pride and arrogance because there were some things that were happening in that context that were challenging my pride and my arrogance. So I had to challenge even more be even more defensive. And here's the key. I thought that whole time, I thought I was doing a really good job of hiding the true nature of my heart, of my attitude, of my pride, and everything else. Following that gathering, a good friend of mine came and confronted me about my behavior. They're like, what was going on? What, 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 what was going on in you? What were you, what were you doing? And there was a moment where suddenly I realized, oh, that was on display for everyone there to see. And again, I felt this overwhelming sense of shame and exposure, like that all, all my self-protection, all of my mask, all of my good boy you know, disguise was like ripped away and everyone had seen it. And I really remember being speechless in that moment. And that proverbial desire for the earth to open up and swallow you whole, like I felt that. I was like, I want to disappear. I couldn't even speak. And then this friend proceeded to affirm their love for me in spite of how I had acted and what I had done. And that, that was unexpected. Love is the doorway out of shame and into authenticity. And specifically, the love of God for his creation displayed through his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. In the book of Romans, chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes about the timing of Christ's death for people. When was it that Jesus died for 
sinners. Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Did you hear that? It's really important. Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't die for the good people. He didn't die for the perfect. He didn't die for the virtuous. He died for the ungodly. He died for the opposite of what and who he is. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for us while we were still entirely covered in sin and shame. Even then, he knew us. We weren't born yet. We weren't even conceived of yet except in the mind of God. But even then, he died for us. He knew all that we have done or will ever do. He's entirely cognizant of our brokenness, our pride, our evil, our self-focus. And he still chose to die in our place so that he could pay for that sin. And the reason is because he loves you and because he loves me. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I know I'm throwing a lot of scriptures at you this morning. That's not something I normally do, but usually I like to preach expositorily through, expositionally through a passage, and this time because we're dealing with a topic, I'm pulling things from around scripture. But in, in the letter of 1 John 4.18, you've probably heard this verse before, but it's so powerful. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. God's love is perfect, and it drives out fear because he knows us utterly and loves us completely. Here's a quote for you by Tim Keller. You've probably heard it before. It is the the core of the gospel. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we're more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. God entirely knows us and fully loves us. See, his entire knowledge of us is terrifying without his full love of us. Full knowledge without love leads to shame. Knowledge with love leads to authenticity and hope. Because he loves us perfectly, we no longer need to live in the depths of shame and the terror of exposure because our worst traits, our most horrific thoughts, and our most evil actions, they're already known. And if we will simply say yes to Jesus, we'll receive not only his love, but his forgiveness for all of it. His death is enough. We use the word sufficient. It's enough to pay for the worst that humanity could think, do, or even imagine. His love is the doorway to authenticity, to a willingness to be truly known by others, because in him, There's no more fear. And finally, we come to this question of living in authenticity. The first step toward living out true authenticity is to accept what I've just been talking about, that Jesus completely knows you and entirely loves you. If we can't accept authenticity with him, we will never live it out with others. I know there's a voice, there's a lying voice that's telling many of us right now that what we have done or who we are is too bad or too awful for Jesus to forgive. Now, if we follow that lie to its logical conclusion, what we're actually saying, the lie is actually that Christ's death really was not enough to pay for our sin. So, we may, we may not have realized before that that's what we believe when we believe that lie, but it's like saying to Jesus, Jesus, thank you. You know, I appreciate your, <laughs> I was really thoughtful of you to die, but it, just, it really wasn't enough for me. Because I'm so bad that I'm even beyond your power and your love to redeem. See, our pride has to die. We have to come to Jesus on his terms because of what he has done, accepting that he knows us and still chose to love us and die for us. So authentic living begins with coming to Jesus and accepting his sacrifice, his love, his forgiveness, and understanding we can't 
earn it. We can't be good enough. It doesn't matter how hard we try. And I've heard that phrase a lot, that there's an accusation that we hear in our minds that you're not enough. I think that the joy of authenticity is that you're right. You're not enough. I'm not enough. None of us are enough, and we don't have to be. The pain comes with trying not being enough and feeling like we have to be and always fighting a losing battle to be enough. We're not enough because Christ is. Jesus is enough. And his death is more than enough to pay for our sin and our brokenness and our perversion, no matter what it is that we've done or thought or said. So if first we embrace authenticity with Jesus, acknowledging that, he's com- that he completely knows us, then next we must embrace authenticity with each other. Galatians 6.2, this is Paul again. He writes this, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So first of all, what is the law of Christ? What did Jesus himself say was the greatest commandment? To love God. And what's the second one? To love others. As Jesus said, all of the law and the prophets hinge on these two commands, right? So interesting. So we want to fulfill that command? We want to fulfill the command to love God and love others? Carry one another's burdens. And what's the doorway to authenticity? Love. God's love to us, our love to him, and our love to one another. So in this verse from Galatians, Paul's telling us that one of the ways we fulfill that law to love is by carrying each other's burdens. Now, there's an implication here, though. If we're carrying other people's burdens, then that means those other people are allowing their burdens to be carried. And that's the part that we're often less comfortable with. So I've said, I, I've said it this way before. It's like, I'm better at carrying the burdens of others than I am at allowing others to carry mine. But that question of authenticity hits right there at the part, am I willing to allow my burdens to be carried by others? Because that is humbling but it's also a step into authenticity. Because each time that we are honest about a burden, whether it's a suffering that we're going through or a specific temptation to sin that we have or a way we've failed, we open that door to authenticity. And more importantly, I really want us to hear this, we open the door to the gospel. Because the gospel is not about people who are perfect that get together and sing on Sunday morning and go about their perfect lives. The gospel is about our perfect Savior, the perfect sacrifice, and about all the people who were dead in our sin and our brokenness and our transgressions that were saved because that perfect sacrifice loved and loves us and died in our place. People who don't know Jesus are not interested in joining a community of perfect people. And if that's what we try to portray about a church, about our body, um, this small part of the body of Christ, if what we're trying to portray is perfection, nobody's going to want to be here. Because that's not what those who are truly hurting and truly desperate need or want. They know they're not perfect. So if we put on masks of perfection, if we choose shame over authenticity, then we deny the gift of the forgiveness and we drive others away from Jesus. So real quickly to close here, two practical steps toward authenticity. The first one is confessing sin. I don't want to get into a big history lesson here. I don't want to get into a a, a big uh, conversation about the Reformation But I think that there were some things in the Reformation, certain babies that were thrown out with bathwater. And one of those was the concept of the confessional. Not in the way that it is traditionally practiced in the Roman Catholic Church with anonymity and always confessing to a priest, but it's biblical that we confess our sins one to another. James 5.16 specifically teaches this. 
Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. We've lost that. So we, we understand the idea of confessing to the Lord. But then that terrifying fear of exposure and shame keeps us from confessing to one another. And I realize that there has to be tact with this and there needs to be wisdom because the call here is not to celebrate sin. That's not what it's about, but it's to celebrate our Savior and our Redeemer. It's like that phrase from Amazing Grace, I once was, but now am. And most of us live right in the middle of those two phrases, right? That's where we are because we're on this journey to, but now am. But at the same time, we've left the I once was behind. And uh, you've heard me talk probably more than you'd like to about the fact that I was addicted to pornography, but I just wanna say this, I've had more opportunities over the course of the last 20, 25 years, I've had more opportunities for ministry because of that broken time in my life. Than, than I have from any other single event, occurrence, or season. I'm not saying I'm glad that I went through that, but I'm saying that as the Lord worked in me and brought me His forgiveness and His freedom and gave me the freedom to be able to share about that more openly, be more authentic about it, it has given me an opportunity to point more and more people to the freedom of the gospel. The second step toward authenticity is It sounds really simple on the face of it, but praying for each other. Sometimes it can be hard to ask for prayer. We don't want to impose on others. And you guys know how it goes. We all do this. Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's great. Going good. Utter lie. It's an utter lie. We're choosing to hide rather than choosing authenticity, which points to the gospel. And I want to apply that specifically here to a moment in our Sunday morning gatherings here. You all know the altars are open after the service. Actually, the altars are open, I'm sorry, after the sermon. The altars are open the whole time. And I think that something that's kind of crept in here, and I don't know how that happened, but maybe there's a sense where you only come to the altar for prayer if it's something big. If there's a major crisis going on in your life. But why would that be? Why would we not want a sister or brother to pray with us about something even more mundane, but it's concerning us? I got a test coming up at school this week. I'm nervous about it. An example that that my sister Julia shared with me, or what about, you know, I've got two college students coming home for their first visit home from college, you know, over Thanksgiving, and I just like prayer that, that that would be a joyful family time and that we would know how to navigate this new season. So I'm hoping that we can just open these doors for response. Praying for each other is one of the best ways we can carry each other's burdens. But again, we have to be authentic enough to reveal what those burdens may be. Because that's going to build trust, it's going to build community, and it's going to encourage one another. And there have been times I've been going through things and I, I just, even if it's a simple text that I get prayed for you this morning or I'm praying about this in your life, those are so encouraging. So sisters and brothers, let's destroy the masks. Masks are useless before God. <laughs> he already sees and knows. And they all, all they do with other people is they drive us further away. Now this is not about celebrating sin. That's not what we're about but for the sake of support and victory, healing and forgiveness. We are willing to make ourselves authentic, fully known to others, so that together we grow up into maturity in Jesus Christ. The last thing I'll close with is just to acknowledge there is a risk that comes with authenticity, and I understand that. And the extreme example we have of that is Jesus himself. As Jesus began to reveal more of who he truly was, they killed him. I don't think that's going to happen here. But there is an inherent risk with saying, this is who I really am. But we can take that risk because he, 
already knows. We are fully known and entirely loved by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, by God the Father, and by the Holy Spirit. As we continue to worship, the altars are open for response, for prayer, for whatever reason it may be. You are free to come. If you want someone to pray with you or over you, come to this side of the altar. If you'd like to respond on your own, come to this side or you can fill in this space here in the front. Let's stand together as we continue to worship our Lord.